Spicy Medtech here, and this video will be a continuation of our parasitology series. We left off at nematodes, specifically Trituris. Today, I will be discussing Strongyloides stercoralis, or the threadworm. Without further ado, let's begin. Now, Strongyloides stercoralis is a nematode belonging once again to the phylum Nematoda. It is also known as the threadworm. Like the previous parasites we have discussed, this worm is also found in the tropics or in places with warmer climates and is once again prevalent in developing countries due to poor sanitation techniques. Now let's describe the ova of this parasite. Strongyloides ova is oval in shape and possesses a clear and thin shell, which closely resembles the ova of the hookworm but are much smaller. These eggs hatch and release the rabditiform larva of this parasite which can either mature into the free-living adult or into the filariform larva, which is the infective stage of this parasite. This worm possesses a long double bulb esophagus intertwined with its uterus, giving the appearance of intertwined threads, hence the name threadworm. But quick disclaimer, in some countries, the common name threadworm is also used to describe another nematode called Enterobius vermicularis, otherwise known as the pinworm. Now, how does one get infected with this parasite? It usually starts when an individual is walking barefoot in soil contaminated with the microscopic filariform larvae, our infective stage. It burrows through both the epidermis and the dermis of the skin into the vascular supply. Once it reaches the vascular supply, it makes its way through the heart, which pumps it out to the lungs, and are eventually coughed up and re-ingested by the host into the bowel, very much similar to that of an Ascaris infection. These larvae will then mature in the small intestine and eventually lay their eggs in the intestinal wall. The eggs embryonate and hatch into rabditiform larvae, and by the time they reach the rectum, they will already have matured into infective filariform larvae. At this point, the filariform can go both ways. One, when the patient defecates, the filariform larvae are released with the stool. Or two, the filariform larvae may burrow right back into the skin of the perianal region. And in some cases, they don't even reach the perianal region and just burrow right into the rectal lumen without exiting the body of the host. We call this phenomenon auto-infection. Now let's discuss the clinical picture of strongyloidiasis. For the initial sign of acute strongyloidiasis, if noticed at all, is a localized pruritic rash at the site of the penetration of the filariform worm. And as mentioned earlier, as the worm makes its way into the lungs, patients may develop a tracheal irritation and may be accompanied by a dry cough. After the larvae make their way into the GI tract, diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, and constipation may occur. The subcutaneous migration of filariform larvae in the autoinfective cycle causes a condition called larva curance that presents itself as an urticarial rash along the buttocks, thighs, and perineum. The disseminated type of strongyloidiasis occurs when the larvae invade numerous organs, which may cause complications to the organs infiltrated, including the lungs, presenting with respiratory complications, the brain with neurologic complications, and sometimes due to excessive migration, larvae may also carry along with them gram-negative bacteria causing bacterial sepsis. Chronic strongyloidiasis is generally asymptomatic, but in those that do present symptoms, it is usually complaints of epigastric pain, constipation, diarrhea, among others. Patients may even present with fecal occult blood in rare cases. Now, how is this diagnosed? Strongyloidiasis is usually diagnosed by microscopic identification of both the rabditiform and filariform larvae in the stool, duodenal fluid, biopsy specimens, and even sputum in disseminated infections. The stool is examined in wet mounts, 
and are best visualized using the Behrman funnel sedimentation technique, the Harada Mori filter paper technique, or the Koga Agar plate culture method. A summary of the methods will be in the description box below. Now, the recommended treatment of strongyloidiasis is ivermectin, but alternatively, doctors may prescribe albendazole. Ivermectin causes worm paralysis through hyperpolarization, flushing the cell membrane of invertebrates, while albendazole, as mentioned in the previous videos, causes microtubule formation disruption. Now, these infections can be prevented with the usual good sanitation techniques along with better hygiene practices. And that would be all. Subscribe to my channel for more medical technology related content like this. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed.